expositions and carnivals hold wonders from all across the United States. If a man is lucky, he may even find his heart's desire. The Man Who Traveled in Elephants by Robert Heinlein Read by Carl Wallace Rain streamed across the bus's window. John Watts peered out at wooded hills, content despite the weather. As long as he was rolling, moving, traveling, the ache of loneliness was somewhat quenched. He could close his eyes and imagine that Martha was seated beside him. They'd always traveled together. They'd honeymoon covering his sales territory. In time, they covered the entire country. Route 66, with the Indians booze by the highway. Route 1, up through the district, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, zipping in and out through the mountain tunnels. If some hunched over the wheel and Martha beside him, handling the map and figuring the mileage to the next stop. He recalled one of Martha's friends saying, but dear, don't you get tired of it? He could hear Martha's bubbly laugh. Will 48 wide and wonderful states to see grow tired? Besides, there's always something new. Fairs and expositions and things. But when you've seen more fair, you've seen them all. You think there's no difference between the Santa Barbara Friesta and the Fort Worth Fat Stock Show? <laughs> Anyhow, Martha had gone on, Johnny and I are country cousins. We like to stare at the tall buildings and get freckles on the roofs of our mouths. Do be sensible, Martha, the woman had turned to him. John, is that time you two were settling down to make something out of your lives? Such people tired him. It's for the possums, he had told her suddenly. They like to travel. The possums? What in the world is he talking about, Martha? Martha had shot him a private glance, then deadpanned. Oh, I'm sorry. You see, Johnny raises uh, baby possums in his uh, umbilicus. I'm equipped for it, he confirmed, patting his round stomach. That unsluttered her hash. Never been able to stand people who give advice for your own good. Martha had read somewhere that a litter of newborn opossums would not more than fit a teaspoon. As many as six in a litter were often orphans through lack of facilities in mother's possum pouch to take care of them all. They had immediately formed the Society for the Rescue of Such Sustenance of the Other Six Possums. And Johnny himself had been unanimously Unanimously selected by Martha as a side of Father Johnny's possum town. They had had other imaginary pets too. Martha and he had hope for children. When none came, their family had filled out with invisible little animals. Mr. Jenkins, the little grey burro who advised them about hotels. Chipmink, the chattering chipmunk who lived in the guff compartment. Must follow longest, the travelling mouse, who never said anything but who would une bite unexpectedly, especially around Marsh's knees. They'd all gone now. They gradually faded away for lack of Martha's gay, affectionate spirit to keep them in health. Even Bindlestiff, who was not invisible, was no longer with them. Bindlestiff was a dog they'd picked up beside the road, far out in the desert, given water and sucker, and received in return his large and uncritical heart. Bindlestiff had traveled with them thereafter, until he too had been called away, shortly after Martha. John Watts wondered about Bindlestiff. Did he roam free in the dog star, and the lands lush with rabbits and uncovered uh, garbage pails? Or likely he was with Martha, sitting on his feet and getting in the way. Johnny hoped so. He sighed and turned his attention to the passengers. A thin, very elderly woman leaned across the aisle and said, Going to the ferry, young man? He started. It was twenty years since anyone called him young man. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. They were all going to the fair. The bus was a special. Do you like going to fairs? Very much. He knew her, her inane remarks were formal gambits to start a conversation. He didn't resent it. Though young women have need of talk with strangers, so did he. Besides, he liked perky old women. They seemed like the very spirit of America to him, putting him in mind of church socials and uh, farm kitchens and covered wagons. I like fairs too, she went on. He used to, even used to exhibit. Quince, jelly, and my crossing the Jordan pattern. Well, blue ribbons, I expect. Some, she admitted. Mostly I'd just like to go to them. Well, this is Alma Hill Evans. Mr. Evans was a great one for going. Take the expedition when they opened the, the, the Panama Canal. But you wouldn't remember that. John watched the minute he had not been there. It wasn't the best of the lot anyway. The fair of 93, that was a fair for you. There'd never be one to even be a patch on that one. Oh, so this one, perhaps. This one? Pish and tush. Sizes and everything. The old American expedition would certainly be the biggest thing yet, and the best. If only Martha were along, it would seem like heaven. The old lady changed the subject. You're a traveling man, aren't you? He hesitated and answered, 
Yes, I can always tell. What line are you in, young man? Hesitated longer than said flatly. I travel in elephants. Selected his sharp when he wanted to explain, but loyalty to Martha kept his mouth shut. Martha insisted they shoot the calling seriously, never explaining, never apologizing. They could take it up when he planned to retire. They'd been talking of getting an acre of ground and doing something useful with radishes or rabbits or such. Then, during their final trip over his sales route, Martha had announced after a long silence, John, you don't want to stop traveling. Eh? Don't I? You mean we should keep the territory? No, that's done. But we won't settle down either. What do you want to do? Just gypsy around? Not exactly. I think we need some new line to travel in. Hardware? Shoes? Ladies ready to wear? No. She stopped to think. We have to travel in something. Give us points here, movements. Think it might be something that doesn't turn over too fast, so we could have a real large territory, say the whole United States. Battleships, perhaps? Battleships out of date, but that's close. Then they passed the barn with a Tedris circus poster. I've got it, she shouted. Elephants. We'll travel in elephants. Elephants, eh? But they're hard to carry samples. We don't need to. Everybody knows what an elephant looks like. Isn't that right, Mr. Jenkins? He visited what Bur Burrow had agreed with Martha, as he always did. The matter was settled. Martha had known just how to go about it. First, we need make a survey. We'll have to home the United States from quarter to quarter before we'll be ready to take orders. For ten years, they had conducted the survey. It was an excuse to visit every fair, zoo, exhibition, stock show, circus, or pumpkin doings anywhere. For were they not all prospective customers? Even national parks and other national wonders were included on the survey. For how was one to tell where a pressing need for an elephant might turn up? Marcia had treated the matter with a straight face and kept a dog-eared notebook. La Brea Tar Pits, Los Angeles. Surplus of elephants, obsolete type, in these parts about 25,000 years ago. Philadelphia, so at least six to the Union League. Brookfield Zoo, Chicago, African elephants, rare. Gallup, New Mexico, stone elephants east of town, very beautiful. Riverside, California, elephant barbershop, race owners to buy mascot. Portland, Oregon, query Douglas Fur Association, recite Road to Mandalay, same for Southern Pine Group. NB, this calls for a trip to Gulf Coast as soon as we finish with rodeo in Laramie. Ten years and they enjoyed every mile of it. The survey was still unfinished when Marsh had been taken. John wondered she'd button told St. Peter about the elephant situation in the Holy City. We paid a nickel she had. But he could not admit to a stranger that traveling in elephants was just his wife's excuse for traveling around the country they loved. The old woman did not press the matter. I knew a man once who sold mongooses, she said cheerfully. Where's that mongoose? You've been in the exterminator business and what's that driver think he's doing? The big bus had rolling from long smoothly despite the driving rain. Now it was swerving, skidding, as lurched sickeningly and crashed. John Watts banged his head against the seat in front. He was picking himself up, dazed, not too sure where he was, when Mrs. Evans' thin, confident soprano orientated him. Nothing excited about folks, I'm not expecting this, because he didn't hurt a bit. John Watts admitted he himself was unhurt. He peered near short sight around and fumbled on the sloping forest for his glasses. He found them, broken. He shrugged and put them aside. Once they arrived, he could dig a spare pair out of his bags. Now, let's see what's happened, the Simmons went on. Come on, young man. He followed obediently. The right wheel of the bus leaned drunkenly against the curb as they approached for a bridge. The driver was standing in the rain, dabbing on a cut of his cheeks. We couldn't help it, he was saying. The dog ran across the road and I tried to avoid it. You might have killed us, the woman complained. Don't cry if you're hurt, advised Mrs. Evans. Let's get back in the bus while the driver phones for someone to pick us up. John Watts hung back to peer over the side of the canyon spanned by the bridge. The ground dropped away steeply, almost under him with large, but mean looking rocks. He shivered and got back in the bus. The relief car came along very promptly, or as he must have dozed. The water he decided, but the rain had stopped and the sun was breaking through the clouds. The relief driver threw his head in the door and said, Come on, folks, time's a wasting. Climb up and climb in. Hurrying, John stumbled as he got aboard. The new driver gave him a hand. What's the matter, Pop? Got shaken up? I'm all right, thanks. Sure you are. Never better. He found a seat by Mrs. Evans, who smiled and said, Isn't it a heavenly day? He agreed. It was a beautiful day, now the storm had broken. Great fleecy clouds tumbling into the bl warm blue sky. A smell of clean, wet pavement, drenched fields, and green things growing. 
He lay back and savored it. While he was soaking up, a great double rainbow formed and blazed in the eastern sky. He looked up and made two wishes, one for himself and one for Martha. The rainbow's colors seemed to be reflected in everything he saw. Even the other passengers seemed younger, happier, better dressed now that the sun was out. He felt light-hearted, almost free from his aching loneliness. They were there in jig time. New driver more than made up the lost minutes. A great arch stretched across the road. The All-American Celebration and Exhibition of Arts and under it, peace and goodwill to all. It drove through and sighed to a stop. Mrs. Heavens uh, hopped up. Got her date. Must run. She trotted to the door and called back. See you on the bin, my young man. Disappeared into the crowd. John Watts got at last and turned to the speaks of the driver. Oh, about my luggage. I want to... Driver started en en entered again. Don't worry. You'll be taken care of. The huge bus moved away. But John Watts stopped. The bus was gone. Oh, very well. What was he, what was he to do without his glasses? There were sounds of carnival behind him. That decided it. After all, I thought tomorrow will do. If anything is too far away for me to see, I can always walk closer. He joined the queue at the gate and went in. It was undeniably the greatest show ever assembled for the wonderment of mankind. It was twice as big as all outdoors. Brighter than bright lights. Newer than new. Stupendous, magnificent, breathtaking, awe-inspiring, super colossal, incredible, and a lot of fun. Every community in America has sent its own best to this amazing show. The marvels of P.T. Barnum, of Ripley, and all of Tom Thomas Edison's godsons have been gathered in one spot. From up and down a broad continent, the riches of a richly endowed land and the products of a clever industrious people have been assembled. Along with our folk festivals, their annual blowouts, their celebrations, and their treasure carnival customs. The result was this American a strawberry shortcake and as gaudy as a Christmas tree, and all the way there before him, noisy and full of life and colored with happy holiday people. Johnny Watts took a deep breath and plunged into it. It started with a Fort Worth Southern Exposition and Fatstock show. He spent an hour admiring gentle, white-faced steers as white and square as flat-top desks, strubbed and curried, with a hair parted neatly from skull to back of spine. Then they old little black lambs on rubbery stalks of legs, too new to know themselves. Fat ewes, their broad backs padded flatter and flatter by gravehoid boys intent on blue ribbons. Next to there you find the Pomona Fair with, with solid matronly percherons and daisy palominos from the Kellogg Ranch. And harness racing. Martin he had always loved harness racing. Picked at a likely looking nag of the famous Dan Patch line and bet and won and moved on. There's so much more to see. Other country fairs were just beyond. Ackles from, from uh, Yakima. The Sherry Festival from Beaumont and Banning. George's Peaches. Somewhere off behind the band was bidding out. Iowa, Iowa, that's where the tall corn grows. Directly in front of him was a pink cotton candy booth. Martha had loved the stuff. Whether at Madison Square Garden or an Imperial County's fairgrounds, he'd always headed first for the cotton candy booth. The big size, honey? Murdered to himself. Thought if he were to look around, he would see her nodding. The large size, please, he said to the vendor. The carny was elderly, dressed in a frock coat and stiff shirt. He handed the the pink gossamer with dignified grace. Certainly, sir. There is no other size. He twirled the paper kind of copy and presented it. Jo Johnny handed him a half dollar. The man flexed and opened his fingers. The coin disappeared. That appeared to end the matter. The candy is 50 cents? Johnny asked it diffidently. No, no, sir. The old man put the coin from Johnny's lapel and handed it back. On the house, I see her with it. After all, with his money... Why, thank you, but I'm not really with it, you know. The old man shrugged. You wish to, to go incognito? Who am I to dispute you? But your money's no good here. Um, if you say so. You will see. He felt something brush against his leg. It was a dog of the same breed, or lack of breed, as Bindlestiff had been. It looked amazingly like Bindlestiff. A dog looked up and waggled his whole body. Why, hello, old fellow. He patted it and his eyes blurred. It even felt like Bindlestiff. Are you lost, boy? No, so am I. Perhaps we better stick together, eh? Are you hungry? The dog looked at his hand. He turns like cotton candy man. What can I buy hot dogs? Just across the way, sir. He thanked him, whistled to the dog, and hurried across. Half a dozen hot dogs, please. Coming up? Just muster everything on. Oh, I'm sorry. I went the raw there for a dog. I get you. Just a sec. 
Presently he was handled six weenies wrapped in paper. How much are they? Compliments for the house. A big part? Every dog has his day. This is his. Oh, well, thank you. If you can't aware of increased noise and excitement behind him and turn around to see the first of the floats of the priests of palace from Kansas City coming down the street. His friend the dog saw it too and began to bark. Quiet, old fellow. Started to unwrap the meat. Someone whistled across the way. The dog darted between the floats and was gone. Johnny tried to follow, but was told to wait until the parade had passed. Between the folks, he got glimpses of the dog, leaping on a lady across the way. Over the dazzling whites of the floats, his own lack of glasses, he could not see her clearly, but it was plain that the dog knew her. He was greeting her with all that enthusiasm only a dog can achieve. He held the package and tried to shout to her. She waved back, but the band music and the noise of the crowd made it impossible to hear each other. We decided to enjoy the poot parade, then cross and find the pooch and his mistress as soon as the last float had passed. It seemed to him the finest priest of palace parade he had ever seen. Couldn't think of it, there hadn't been a priest of palace parade in a good many years. Must have revived it just for this. It was like Kansas City, a grand town. He didn't know if any, any he liked as well. Possibly Seattle, and New Orleans, of course. And Duluth, Duluth was swell. So was Memphis. He liked it on a bus the way that, that Ran from Memphis to St. Joe, from Natchez to Mobile, wherever the wide winds blew. Mobile, that was a town. The parade was past now, with a swarm of small boys tagging after it. He hurried across. The lady was not there, neither she nor the dog. He walked quite thoroughly. No dog, no lady with a dog. He wandered off, his eyes alert for marvels, but his thoughts on the dog. It really had been a great deal like Bindlesniff. He wanted to know who the lady belonged to. Anyone who could love that sort of dog must be a pretty good sort herself. Perhaps he could buy her ice cream, or persuade her to go to the midway with him. Mar Martha would approve, he was sure, even though she wasn't up to anything. Anyway, no one ever took a little fat man seriously. There was too much going on to worry about it. He found himself at St. Paul's Winter Cathedral, marvelously constructed in summer weather so the combined efforts of York and American. For 50 years it had been held in January. Yeah, here it was, rubbing shoulders with the Pendleton Roundup, the Fresno Races Festival, and Colonial Week in An Annapolis. He got into the tail end of the ice show, but in time for one of his favorite acts, the old smoothies, out of retirement for the occasion and gliding as perfectly as ever to the strains of sh Shine On Harvest Moon. His eyes bored again, and it was not his lack of glasses. Coming out, he passed a large sign, Sadie Hawkins Day, starting point for bachelors. He was tempted to take part. Perhaps the lady with the dog might be among the spinsters. But he was a little tired by now. Just ahead there was an outdoor carnival of the pony and the ferris wheel sort. A moment later he was on the merry-go-round and was climbing gracefully into one of those swan gondolas so favored by parents. He found a young man already seated there reading a book. Oh, excuse me, said Johnny. Do you mind? Not at all. The young man asked her to put his book down. Perhaps the man you're, old, you're the man I'm looking for. You were looking for someone? Yes, you see, I'm a detective. I've always wanted to be one, and now I am. Indeed? Quite. Everyone rides the merry-go-round eventually, so it saves time to wait here. Of course, I hang around Hollywood and Vine or Times Square or Canal Street, but here I can sit and read. How can you read while waiting for someone? Oh, I know it's in the book. He held up. It was The Haunting of the Snark, so that leaves my eyes free for, for watching. Johnny began to like this young man. Are there boojums about? No, for we haven't softly and silently vanished away. But we'll be noticed if we did. I must think it over. Are you a detective too? No, I, um, I travel on elephants. A fine profession. But well, not much for you here. We have giraffes. He raised his voice above the music of the carnival, and when his eyes roved around the carousel. Camels, two zebras, plenty of horses, but no elephants. Be sure to see the big parade. There'll be elephants. Oh, I won't, wouldn't miss it. It wasn't? be the most amazing parade in all time. So long, it will never pass a given point, and every mile choke at one is more stupendous than the last. You sure you're not the man I'm looking for? I don't think so. But see here, how would you go about finding a lady with a dog in this crowd? Well, if you come here, I'll let you know. Better go down to Canal Street. Yes, I think if I were a lady with a dog, I'd be down on Canal Street. Women love to mask. Means they can unmask. Johnny stood up. How do we get to Canal Street? Straight to Central City, past the Opera House, and turn right at the Rose Bowl. Be careful then, for you pass in the Nebraska section with uh, Axar Ben in full swing. 
anything could happen. After that, Calvaris County, mind the frogs, then Canal Street. Thank you so much. He followed the directions, keeping an eye out for a lady with a dog. Nevertheless, he stared with wonder at the things he saw as he started to the gay crowds. He did see a dog, but it was a CIA dog. That was a great wonder, too. For the live, clear eyes of the dog's master could indeed see everything that was going on around him. Yet the man and the dog traveled together, with the man willing the dog direct their way. As if no other way of travel were conceivable, or desired, by either one. He found himself at Canal Street presently. The illusion was so complete it was hard to believe he had not been transported to New Orleans. Carnival was a height, was a height. It was Fat Tuesday here. The crowds were masked. He got a mask from a street vendor and went on. The hunt seemed hopeless. The street was choked by Murray Americans walking into the parades of the crew of Venus. It was hard to breathe, much harder to move in search. He eased into Bourbon Street. The entire French Quarter had been reproduced when he saw the dog. He was sure it was the dog. He was wearing a clown suit and a little peaked hat, but it looked like his dog. He directed himself. It looked like Bindlestiff. And accepted one of the Frankfurters gratefully. Where is she, old fellow? The dog woofed once, then darted away into the crowd. He tried to follow, but couldn't. He required more clearance. But he was not downhearted. He'd find the dog once, he would find him again. Besides, it had been at a masked ball that he first met uh, Martha. She a graceful purette, he a fat perot. They watched the dawn come up after the ball, and before the sun had set again, they had agreed to marry. He watched the, the crowd for purettes. Sure, somehow the dog's mistress would cost him so. I think about this term, and think even more about Martha, if that were possible. How she'd travel this territory with him. A bit of her habit to start out anywhere whenever a vacation came along. Chuck the Duncan's Hines guide with some bags in the car and be off. Martha, sitting beside him with the open highway or broad ribbon before them, singing their road song, uh, America the Beautiful, and keeping him on key. What she said to him while they were bowling along through, what was it, the Black Hills, the Ozarks, the Poconos? No matter. She said, Johnny, you'll never be president, and I'll never be first lady, but I bet we know more of the United States than any president ever has. Those busy, useful people never have time to see it, not really. It's a wonderful country, darling. It is, it is indeed. I can spend all eternity just traveling around a bit. Traveling in elephants, Johnny, with you. He reached over and patted your knee. You remember how it felt. The rivers and the mock French Quarter were sending out. They drifted away while he daydreamed. He stopped a red devil. Where's everyone going? To the parade, of course. The big parade? Yes, it's forming now. The red devil moved on. He followed. His own sleeve was plucked. Did you find her? With Mrs. Evans, slightly disguised by a black domino and clutching the arm of a tall and elderly Uncle Sam. Oh, why, hello, Mrs. Evans. What do you mean? Don't be silly. Did you find her? I didn't know I was looking for anyone. Of course you were. Well, keep looking. You must go now. They trailed after the mob. The big parade was already passing by the time we reached this route. It didn't matter. There was endlessly more to come. The hallway covered out of boosters were passing. They were followed by the prize Shriner drill team. Then came the veiled pro prophet of Coruscant and his queen of love and beauty. Up in their cave at the bottom of the Mississippi. The anniversary day parade from Brooklyn with the school children carrying little American flags. The rose parade from Pasadena. Miles of flower covered floats. The Indian power from Flagstaff. 22 nations represented no buck in the march wearing less than a thousand dollars worth of hand wrought jewelry. As indigenous Americans rode Buffalo Bill, goatee jutting out in hat in hand, locks blowing in the breeze. There was the decoration from Hawaii with King uh, Kamehameha himself playing Ali, Lord of Carnival, with royal abandon, while his subjects in do fresh lays pranced behind him, giving aloha to all. There was no end. Square dancers from Ojai and from upstate New York. Dames and gentlemen from Annapolis, the, the Kira, Texas, Turkey Trot. All the crews and marching clubs of all New Orleans, double flambeau blazing, double throwing favorites of the crowd, the king of zoos in his smooth brown court singing, and the mummers came, taking a suit up the street to all them golden slippers. There was something older than the country celebrating it, the shuffling jig of the maskers, a step that was young when mankind was young and first celebrating the birth of spring. First the fancy clubs, whose captains wore capes worth a king's ransom, or a mortgage on a row house with 50 pages to bear them, then the Liberty Clowns and the other comics, and lastly the ghostly sweet string bands who sprang green tears. 
Johnny thought back to 44 when he first seen the march. Old men and young boys, because the proper shooters were away to war. And of something that should not be, on Broad Street in Philadelphia, on the first street of January, men riding in the parade together, because merciful heaven forgive us, they could not walk. We looked and saw they were indeed automobiles in the line of march, wounded of the last war. And when G.I.R., hat square, hands folded over the head of his cane, Johnny held his breath and waited. With each automobile approached the judge's stand, it stopped short of it, and every one got out. Somehow, with each other's help, they hobbled or crawled past the judging line under their own power, and every club's pride was kept intact. There followed another wonder. They did not get back in the automobiles, but marched on up Broad Street. Then there was Helly Red Boulevard, disguised as Santa Claus Lane, and a production more stupendous than moving line had ever attended before. They were baby stars galore, and parents and favorites, and candy for the children, and all the grown up children, too. When at last Santa Claus's own float arrived, it was almost too big to be seen. A veritable iceberg, almost the North Pole itself, with John Jet Braymore and Mickey Moss running on each one side of St. Nicholas. On the tail end of the great icy float was a pathetic little figure. Johnny Squinter recognized Mr. Emmett Kelly, Dean of all clowns, in his role as uh, uh, Willie Willy. Willy Willie was not merry. I don't know, he was shivering. Johnny didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Mr. Kelly had always affected them that way. And the elephants came. Big elephants, little ones, middle-sized elephants, from pint-sized wrinkles to mighty jumbo. And with them the bull man, Chester Conklin, P.T. Barnum, Wally Berry, Mowgli. This, Johnny said to himself, must be Mulberry Street. There was a commotion on the other side of the column. One of the men was shooing something away. The Johnny saw what it was, the dog. He whistled. The animal seemed confused. Then it spotted him, scampered up, and jumped into Johnny's arms. You stay with me, Johnny told him. You might have gotten stepped on. The dog lifted his face. He lost his clown suit, but the little peaked cap hung down under his neck. What have you been up to? asked Johnny. And where's your mistress? The last of the elephants were approaching, three abreast, pulling a great carriage. A bugle sounded in front, and the procession stopped. Why are they stopping? Johnny asked the neighbor. Wait a moment, you'll see. The Grand Marshal of the March came trotting back down the line. He rode a black stallion with himself brave in villain's boots. White peg breeches, cutaway, and top hat. He glanced all around. He stopped immediately in front of Johnny. Johnny held the dog more closely to him. The Grand Marshal dismounted and bowed. Johnny looked around to see who was behind him. The man removed his tall silk hat and caught Johnny's eye. You, sir, are the man who travels in elephants? More statement than a question. Um, yes. Greetings, Rex. Serene Majesty, your queen and your court await you. The man short sightly as if to lead the way. Johnny gulped and gathered Bindlestiff under one arm. The marshal went into the elephant-drawn carriage. A dog slipped out of his arms and bounded up on the carriage on the lap of the lady. She patted it and looked proudly, happily down at Johnny Watts. Hello, Johnny. Welcome home, darling. Martha, he sobbed. Eric stumbled and climbed into the carriage to embrace his queen. The sweet voice of a bugle sounded up ahead. The parade started up again, wending its endless way. The End